My name is Kamal Badrashani and I run the Durham Archaeomaterials Research Center, or the Dark Lab uh, for short. I think it's quite punchy, you know, and people, people seem to really remember it. And as a matter of fact, no one ever calls it the Durham Archaeomaterials Research Center. It's always dark. <laughs> you know, so for some reason it must, uh, you know, build something up in people. But it's uh, very catchy and people refer to it almost immediately as dark. This lab is dedicated uh, to analyzing archaeological materials, so it is pretty much exactly as it sounds. I mean, when you have an archaeological object and you want to know what it's made of, I mean, you basically bring it to us and we tell you, you know, what kind of metal it is. Um, but going beyond that, not only just what it is, you know, things, aspects of how it was made, um, the sort of technologies involved. At the moment, uh, we are uh, participating in an exhibition uh, taking place at the Bose Museum, and it features objects that were excavated as part of the current rescue excavations and the expansion of the A1. And I was given two objects. Uh, one was a brooch and one was a spur. They were conserved, and the conservator thought that they were gold. And I was given this object to confirm the sort of precious metal value uh, in order for, for them to fill out a treasure report. But lo and behold, when we did the analysis, we found that actually they were, they were copper alloys. So what these represent are two sort of attempts. I mean, I wouldn't call them fakes, but attempts to make something that looks like gold. And, you know, the, the interesting thing was they did this in two very different ways. So in the first way, it was just a, just a brass. And the second, they used a very, very high tin uh, copper alloy in order to get this lustrous effect. So, I mean, we thought it was one thing and now we know, you know, it's another. You can use a, a one or two methods. Uh, ho however, we use this uh, scanning electron microscope, which is behind me. Um, the word microscope implies that it is used to magnify images and you can, you know, put it under there and it can magnify images. Um, but what it also does is it gives you an idea of composition. The way this machine works is it um, focuses an electron beam at an object, and once the electrons interact with the object, two things happen. Uh, one, an X-ray is produced, um, which is characteristic of whatever element that object is made of, and the second is that the uh, electrons are backscattered, and the more electrons will be backscattered depending on the density uh, of the object. So where we have a higher density object, such as gold versus silver, gold is of a higher density, it will appear brighter in the image. So not only can we magnify the image, but the brightness will tell us where the object is higher in gold and where it is um, higher in silver. So for example, if you have an object that was um, silver plated with gold, you would see where the plating survives in a way that you might not be able to see um, with the naked eye. So here's, here's an object that is part of a, a, a silver thread that was used in a, in a textile from the medieval period. And one of the questions we had was these, were, with these were, you know, whether or not they were 13th, 14th century or a little bit later. And a lot of these objects tended to be gilded, so they were silver with, uh, with a bit of gold plating. And whether or not they were um, gilded on both sides uh, it was something that would, would inform on its age. So we were able to do this um, examination. And with the scanning electron microscope, you know, we can point at any uh, point on this picture and get, get a chemical analysis, so we'll know the the exact chemical composition at any at any point down to the level of a micron, so it's a very useful tool um, for that. These uh, this is actually a thread, so you, you have um, organic threads, but then this is woven uh, sort of around them. Um, so these are the the remnants of the organic thread. And remember earlier I was saying the higher the chemical density, the brighter the object. So these threads, being made mostly of carbon, have quite a low chemical density, and they appear very dark on the screen. Whereas the metal, of course, being you have a high chemical density, it appears very, very bright. So, um, and you know, of course, the examination of these threads and the way in which these knots were tied, although not my expertise, you know, but, but something that can be done. And it's where the scanning electron microscope would be very useful because you can get a very, very high level magnification, um, more than is possible with a normal optical microscope. What you're looking at is not an image in the, in the way that you're used to it. It's not that you're seeing a visible light spectrum. Remember, our eyes can only see in the visible spectrum. And this, uh, these, um, this response is at a wavelength that is much higher than our eyes can see at a much higher energy. Um, and therefore, uh, what you're actually looking at is, is a map of effectively chemical density, but just sort of translated so that your eyes can see it as an image. One of, one of the issues we wanted with these was to understand exactly how these, um, these threads were, were made and what their chemical composition was and what their alloy composition was, so, um, which also informs on age. <clears throat> so we wanted to test to see exactly how pure uh, the silver was. And in fact, we found that these are made of an incredibly high purity silver, something approaching you know, 95, 99%. And it, as a matter of fact, so pure it's difficult to detect you know, what kind of things were being mixed in with them, which in a normal situation for a ring or something like that, you would definitely need to add something to the silver. But in this case, because it needs to be malleable, it needs to be able to be um, worked in such a way, probably they could get away with using very high, high purity silver. 
a new sort of strand of you know, the kind of research and a new technique we're beginning to teach here at Durham uh, revolves around 3D digital technologies and digital heritage, um, both for you know preservation and for artifact and you know landscape analysis. And many staff have begin, begun to develop their skill set in this field. Um, using what we call structure for motion photogrammetry, we can capture um, a number of images which can be turned into very, very high resolution photorealistic 3D models of pretty much anything, landscapes, um, artifacts. Uh, we have been working on the Scottish Soldiers Project where we've been making 3D models of bones and teeth to a very, very high resolution. And then these 3D models can be used um, and we can then take them to be printed, which has a number of purposes. I mean, many ask, you know, what the utility of 3D printing is, but, you know, this is a new technology that's only going to be um, improved uh, with time. And the 3D prints help us in a number of ways. The obvious one is engagement. So, um, you know, if there are objects that, you know, are quite precious and can't be touched, if we can make a, a 3D model, especially using structure for motion photogrammetry, we can make a 3D model without having to engage or interact with the object at all, really, or minimally uh, touching it. And then we can make facsimiles, quite, quite realistic ones using, you know, in full color that then, you know, can go alongside the exhibition and people can then engage with it. And I think they would get a better sense of the original object and it would enhance um, their experience. The other is as a research tool. Now, I have one instance where um, a person made 3D models of several bones that were from the same grave in Italy. Uh, however, they were excavated a very long time ago, and if you'll believe it, you know, pieces of the same, the ankle of this individual ended up in four different museums. So the only way for this person to actually put them all together was to build an individual 3D model of every single piece and then print them here, to very high specification, and then he actually was able to combine them and you know we saw that they they indeed uh, indeed fit and they were from the same individual thus proving it so you can see that the research applications are, are also there as well being a student here would would give you the ability to be involved in a number of these projects so you'll see a wide variety of materials as they pass through this lab and you'll be able to engage with these materials and learn a lot about how they're analyzed and, and how we look at them to gain information about about how they were made and about how they were used in past societies